every other week or so, we try to get a guest speaker, somebody else in the Salesforce industry that we really look up to, respect. I know Jody's name came up a ton when we were trying to look for guest speakers for this year. And um, what we try to do is we just want to really kind of have this time for all of you um, to kind of get in, get to know our guest speaker, in this case, Jody tonight. And then um, we really kind of want this time to be for you guys. So I have questions lined up that I can ask Jody to kind of get the ball rolling. Um, but kind of the main point is all of you guys are, are going to be new to the Salesforce industry or already in the industry. You just started. And it's a good place for you to get to know some other people outside of myself and also to get a different perspective on things. So obviously in our community, we have um, everything that I think that you should be doing and the, my approach to it, my style, um, but it's really a nice uh, option that we have to bring someone else in and share their opinion and the way that they've attacked it. Something might resonate a little bit different with you um, from somebody else. So with that being said, questions are always highly encouraged. Um, we'll do our chat like we usually do. So you have kind of two options there. You can just throw it in the chat and I can read it off to Jody, or you can always raise your hand and then um, I'll call you and then you can, you know, go off of mute and ask Jody yourself. So with all that being said, I don't want to take the thunder away from our guest tonight with Jody. So Jody, uh, to kind of start us off, I wanted to see if you'd be willing to give us a quick little introduction of who you are and how you fit into the Salesforce industry. Sure, absolutely. So hello, hello. I'm excited to see some familiar faces out there. Um, so for those I have not met, my name is Jody Herbeck. And um, I think my claim to fame at this point is I have been Salesforcing for a living for over two decades, believe it or not. And I always tell everybody I was literally at the very first Dreamforce. Um, way back in the day. It's my proof point. Um, and I have been on all sides of the table. I um, have spent probably the, the bulk of my career on the client side, and I'll fill you in in a minute on what I'm currently doing, um, but have spent time as an independent consultant. I spent four years working for the mothership, um, but have in the last eight years been in various roles running a Salesforce team um, inside enterprise organizations. Um, along the way, I've worked for small companies, for startups, for, for big companies, um, have worked primarily um, with kind of the traditional clouds, um, sales cloud, service cloud, um, and something else that's kind of interesting that happy to talk about if, if, if it um, raises any eyebrows at my current role, actually, where I work we have 1,500 users and we don't use any cloud. It's what we call a pure platform as a service where uh, we build our custom apps and our custom workflows having nothing to do with CRM. Um, so I've seen all the different use cases um, of the platform. I um, wrote a book um, about six months ago. I launched my book, so shameless plug. I got to plug it here. Uh, Rocky Roll at the Salesforce admin, and I would love to chat a little bit about that. Um, and Brandon's in the house. Woot, woot. Um, so I'll pause there for questions. Okay, perfect. I appreciate the introduction. Um, I tried to also get your LinkedIn over there in the chat for us, as well as where they can go purchase your book. Um, I'm always a big believer in like trying to support one another while we're here with whatever endeavors we're trying to do. Um, so I think it's awesome one way to support you that way to go purchase your book, but also um, just the sheer number of people that have recommended how awesome it is. And I think just like how much experience you have in the industry is another thing, because you've really seen you're not like in this weird spot where I feel like even myself I am in where it's like, okay, I've been here five years or so. And I've kind of been riding like this high, right? So it's just like, okay, we're going up. Salesforce is awesome. And you've really been there from the get-go to kind of see the ups and downs and how things have changed and how things have been updated. Um, so I think a lot of that really plays into the book itself and like your experiences you've had with that. So just wanted to highlight that as well for everybody uh, in the chat that's looking at that link. Um, one thing I did want to ask you is far as like your introduction goes. So you gave us some background of where you've been, what you do. Um, your book itself is called Rock Your Role as a Salesforce Admin. 
Um, at this point, would you say that is like where you are mainly trying to focus your priority or is that split between something else that you're trying to be a champion of, or how does that work out for in terms of admins versus something else? Is that what you mean by that? As far as like, are you trying to, I guess at this point in your career, I know you've written this book. Are you trying to really champion the idea of we need to make this role better? And that's what I want to kind of stand for. Or is that just one of like the side hustles and it's like, also I'm trying to do, you know, better at consulting or whatever else you're trying to do. Sure. Is there something sure. like that? Sure. So kind of two different questions. So what one I'll preface this with, I still have a full-time job. Um, so, um, you know, oftentimes I'm thinking about all these really, you know, things I should be doing for my book launch and my mailing list. And guess what? In real life, I don't do any of that stuff because I actually still work for a living and work a lot. Um, so I should, I should definitely be very clear, um, that my work and my, my book are a little bit different and my, I wrote my book really because it, it felt like something that needed to be out there and, um, you know, very selfishly, I wrote it because I lead hire and lead and manage and coach a lot of Salesforce admins. And it was frankly, the book I wish I had to hand to them and say, here, here's what my expectations are. Here's how to do this beyond the point and click and the hands on keyboards, right? So that's what Trailhead's going to give you. That's what you're going to learn. But what I found over time is people didn't necessarily know how to translate that to like, what, what do I actually do when I, when I show up? And I found that oftentimes we had people that really wanted to go above and beyond, but like they, they didn't have any ideas of like, what do I do besides like, you know, set up my users and, you know, take the requests. And sometimes it was really just empowering people with kind of the ideas, empowering them with the understanding of the influence that they could have in that role that, you know, that made a really big difference. And I also found that a lot of people that, you know, I've talked to in the course of my career, they work for people that aren't Salesforce practitioners. Um, you know, maybe they're a solo admin, maybe they're part of a sales ops team or a rev ops team, more and more, maybe now they're part of a technology team, but still not necessarily working for Salesforce practitioners. That's not uncommon. And so a lot of these things that I think, you know, I and my team have taken for granted, I realized like, oh, that never occurred to somebody. So I started writing the book really for that reason, because it, it felt like something that um, needed, needed to be shared. Um, and then I'll, I'll kind of jump into the second half of why I wrote the book. And it's something I feel very passionate about is um, I'm, I am bullish on a Salesforce career. You will not find anyone except maybe Jordan um, who is going to be more excited and more optimistic about a career. I mean, I've been trying to talk everybody I know for 20 years from friends, family, Uber drivers, pizza delivery people, whatevs, you know, to come into this career. Um, but I will also always be the first one to say, like, it's hard. This is not like magic pixie dust and suddenly I'm a Salesforce admin and I'm, you know, eating bonbons and golfing. Like it is a hard career and we work really hard. It's the best. I love it. And something I don't think we talk enough about is it's, it's just fun. Like it is fun to be a Salesforce admin. It is fun to sit down and talk to somebody about what their needs are and what their challenges are and be like, hold on. I'll be back in a little while and mock something up and bring it to them. And their eyes light up and they're like, holy smokes, you just did that. Like, wow, that just, that would have saved me hours. Like, that's fun. Like, that's why we do it. But we work hard. Hopefully we're, we're learning, myself included and my team, how to work smarter. But the other reason that I wrote the book is I feel passionately about the fact that if I'm going to teach people how to over deliver and how to go above and beyond, which I think everybody should do, because that's really where you reap the rewards of this career, right? But I feel passionately if I'm going to do that, I also have to teach people how to do it without overwhelm and how to put up some business boundaries and how to talk about trade-offs and some of those other things. So the, the book is in two parts and, and it's written for kind of, I'm going to say two different audiences or you know two different stages. The, the first half, I'm guessing for this group of people is probably going to resonate more, right? It's the ideas. It's how do I add value? It's what kind of things should I be thinking about? Um, and then the second half, absolutely give it a read. There's probably some good things that apply to all roles, but I'd encourage you, I'm not going to say if, I'm going to say when you start that role, 
go back and check out part two, because that's really, I think, where that half is going to resonate more. That was great. That was a great breakdown of what kind of inspired you for the book. I love that um, you took a lot of those experiences you've had. And like you said, it was like something you've kind of felt like almost like a calling for to say, hey, listen, like this is something I feel like needs to be out there. This is information that I would have wanted or how I would tell you how to do that. And what I think is so cool about people in Ohana that I really want to like kind of push that idea to create products or write books or, you know, post that blog, whatever it is that you're thinking of, because we all have a different uh, set of circumstances and we all have a different set of experiences that we go through. And really, it's kind of our way for us to be able to do that at a large scale, right? Because it's like you only have so much time in the day to sit there and jump on calls or do your thing to try to help people individually. Like you said, talking to Uber drivers and the whole bit. Um, but you can have this book where it like almost replicates you. It clones exactly what you would say to them. And then it takes that away. So it's just like, hey, you can now just go purchase this book. And this is exactly what I would tell you anyways. So I love that. I love that you broke that piece down. And I'm a big encourager of that same thing. It's just the end of the day, we're all here to try to help each other and we're all going to have a different style of the way we would approach it. So it's awesome to be able to kind of put something out there online or in written form like you have so that we can share that. Um, for some folks, I know I've heard this in our community um, as far as like a newsletter or a blog and some have even expressed even a book. If somebody wanted to go that route, how would you break down? How did you go from this full-time person in Salesforce and is this your first book that you've written? I should have asked that before we started. So it is the first book that I've written. Okay. It is not the first book that I've published. Okay. So fun fact, and I was looking around the room to see if I had one to, to show up and I don't. <laughs> A fun fact is my pandemic project, right? We all had our pandemic projects on lockdown, is um, my, my mother-in-law had passed away and we uncovered a manuscript that she wrote. She was a private eye in Southern Louisiana for 40 years. She passed away just about 80, she was 81 and had literally only been retired for a couple of years. So from the seventies all the way up through the decades, imagine what she saw down there. So we found her memoir and she'd mentioned it once or twice but she'd never really like talked much about it. And, you know, so we kind of were like, oh, whatevs and pulled it out. It was like, this thing is good. It's a series of vignettes. So lo and behold, if you want a little light reading, it makes a great gift for parents and grandparents. It's called Granny PI and it is available on Amazon. We also, um, we also did, um, had an audio book done. And honestly, it was, for me, it was a, that was a labor of love in, you know, honor of my mother-in-law but it was also an opportunity for me to learn how to self-publish. So my book is self-published and I spent a lot of time reading, watching classes, learning how to do it, learning, you know, what resources I could, you know, I needed to hire. So I had an editor, um, a book cover designer. So I did that once. And then honestly, I, we were still under lockdown and it's like, okay, I've had this book brewing around in my head for quite a while. I don't even have an excuse anymore because I know how to do it and I can't leave my house. Like if I can't, I can't get this over the finish line now. I got a problem. So that really honestly, when people say, How did you do it? The secret sauce was lockdown did not hurt for the record. Okay, cool. So did you use some of those skills? Um, because you'd already kind of had to, uh, even though you didn't write it, still try to balance your current job and what you wanted to do with that to um kind of do both projects. Were you able to kind of use some of those same skills? And if so, what were those skills that you use to balance? I got my current job and responsibilities yeah. there. And then obviously your own life. And then outside of that, I'm also going to start writing and publish this book. Yeah. How did you do that? Yeah. And what, what I will tell you is I haven't always done it particularly well, right? So let, let's be honest here is, you know, this, this book got started in 2019 I left my job. I took a month off, got a couple certs. I was, uh, if you've read my book, you've heard me in a chapter talk about, I'd lost my voice. I was in burnout. I was literally hoarse for the entire month. And that was, I sat down and, you know, knocked out a really good solid draft. 
Um, and then I started a job and as often happens, right? Side projects go to the wayside, draft went in the drawer and it didn't see the light of day for two years. And I share this because A, it makes the case that like we work hard, but it also makes the case that like there's a season for everything, right? And where I was at that time, I needed to be all in on that role. And then I made some shifts inside the organization, even during the pandemic that gave me more, more time to myself. And I, I, have, I, you know, I have a little bit of tenure and ability to do some negotiations with my role to do that. I actually shifted my job last year from a um, managing the team to an independent contributor role in order to make time for some of the things they've been doing. I knew I had a book launch. I wanted to be on LinkedIn, but I like to share that with everybody because, you know, it is, it is hard to work full time, to excel at your job, to have a life and also, you know, be able to do all the things that we imagine ourselves doing in the Ohana, right? I'm going to go speak and ride and post and, you know, that's all great. And it's an awesome thing to do a, if you can, and B, if you enjoy it, right. Got to find what your thing is. But what, what I find is a lot of people feel bad because they're not doing enough or doing it well, or doing it as consistently as they thought, especially folks that have really had a lot of opportunity in the job search time period or while they were learning. And then all of a sudden they go get their job and go, oh man, I've been working my tail off. You know what, it, it is okay. And that's part of the reason I like to share the story, Jordan, to say, I didn't always do it well. I came, I went, I leaned in, I leaned out. You know, I, I, I spent, you know, I left Salesforce in 2000, I don't know, nine or 10. And you probably didn't see me in public at Dreamforce and, certainly not on LinkedIn or anything for 10 years. Why? Because I was working my tail off and having a life, right? So I like to say that because I'm on LinkedIn a lot right now. And I think it, you know, sometimes it feels like, oh, well, shouldn't I be able to have my job and have my kids and have my family and do that? And not necessarily. So yeah, you heard it here first. Yeah, I really like that you shared that. So thank you. Um, and I think it's another good reminder to us as we, for a lot of us, right, that have grown up with social media kind of just a part of our lives. It's easy to forget that there is somebody on the other end and it's easy to forget that they also have their own stuff going on in life. So another big reason um, why I love just seeing people like yourself being so positive on LinkedIn and trying to share what you know and just trying to support that is because, yeah, at the end of the day, you don't need to be doing that. And at the end of the day, I'm sure you got things on your mind that you want to be taken care of or things that are going on that are stressing you out, just like myself. And so it just kind of adds another layer when you find people that are like trying to be negative towards that, because it's like, one, don't even need to be doing this. Two, why try to like upset that process of somebody wanting to go out of their way to help us by trying to be negative about what they share. So love that you shared that because that that is like the real side of it. Um, I know Brandon had his hand up. So Brandon, feel free to jump off mute and ask your question. Jody, how are you? Brandon, I feel like it, I know you. Have we not talked uh, before? I know. How are you? Doing good. So, so glad that you're on the call with us tonight. Um, I guess my question is kind of for the whole group. Um, you've hit at this kind of on and off on a lot of your LinkedIn posts, but I know many of us are looking to kind of land our first role. Um, you're, you've been a hiring manager. You've kind of been in a lot of different roles. Um, Outside of obviously getting our certification, like what are some recommendations um, of areas that we could really focus on? So when we step into the, the role, we're prepared as far as like these, you know, I know I saw a post one time you said like reports and data loading. And so that's my first question. And then my second question is, I know you've hinted at another book. So I want you to give us the scoop on what your next book's going to be. So we hear it here first on Simple Salesforce. You guys well, can, you you can go. vote. You can vote <laughs> on my options. All right, let's let's take the first one. So um, I think specifically the post that you're referring to is I, I said to everybody, I know everybody's trying to go in all, and learn flow, which I'm not saying you shouldn't, but what I had said was the reality for most entry-level Salesforce jobs is you're probably not going to be building a lot of flows. Not to, there are every flavor of Salesforce admin jobs. So every time I make a generalization you can find five jobs that are gonna prove me wrong. So I'm well aware of that. But the reality is, unless you take a solo admin job, day one, week one, year one, that's not gonna be your responsibility in the organization. 
Um, odds are good that, especially if you're on the client side, you're going to be doing more of some of the things that we just mentioned. You're going to be doing a whole lot of data loads. Um, if, if it were me, I would, I would be practicing data load or left, right, the other. I would be understanding the difference between insert, upsert, how to format years, how to format date time. You know, like those are the things that that'll get you and that'll impress somebody, by the way, if you can give some of those nuances. Um, you are going to be doing a whole lot of reports and dashboards, right? So you're not necessarily building things from scratch. You're going to be, you know, asked to, you know, take an existing set of data and slice it, dice it, look at different ways that you can represent it um, on a dashboard. Um, certainly some of the, I, you know, I call it the, you know, user administrivia, right? I got to be able to set up and understand roles profiles. Um, I do think that everybody needs to understand the core of a custom object and the data model and a little bit about that. So I'm, you know, if, if you've seen any of my posts, you know, I always say hands on keyboard for the win. Absolutely. I believe what everybody should be doing, not just to get a job, because, but as much as it's how you learn it is find something to build in your dev org that's meaningful to you, whatever that is. If it's your kid's sleep schedule, if it's your dog walking schedule, if it's your, you know, categorizing your 19, you know, thousand album covers, whatever you got, like, Find something that is important to you where you are the client as well as the admin, where you care about how it looks, how it feels, how it reports, get your hands on keyboards. And that to me helps you at least understand the mechanics of the platform outside of any particular cloud. You guys know I'm partial to that. I, I led and said that's that's what I'm working on today. So I think in terms of the work, those would be the things that I would say to really be focused on. Um, process mapping. You know, I think, I don't know who it was. It might've been you, Jordan. We were recently, somebody was posting online about like, hey, documentation saying you like it might actually be advantageous because everybody needs it, right? Like those are a lot more the reality of, I think the kind of work that people are going to be doing. I, I do think that, you know, flow, flow, we're at an inflection point, like flow is a whole new ball game right now. And, you know, there's, there's going to be, um, you know, a tremendous need for it. And, you know, people that get it and understand it, you know, absolutely. If that's you, anyone on this call, if you're like, I've been studying Salesforce and man, I get it and I'm rocking it and I want to go all in. I'm certainly not encouraging you not to do that. But what I'm am also trying to say is there's a whole lot involved in understanding what flow does and how it works. So there's, you know, concepts that really almost get into programming. That's not a great early entree, right? That That's something that is going to make you probably feel a little bit more overwhelmed if it's not your thing. And it's not likely what somebody truthfully is going to expect that you're going to know or do. So those would be the things I would say to focus on. And then I would also say, you know, everybody in this group that I'm looking at right now has all sorts of unbelievable experience. I know there's military people here. I think I have a nurse here. Um, you know, like you guys have like major life skills and do not discount that, right? Do not discount that. What I can tell you as a hiring manager is if I'm hiring a junior admin, I know that you don't know Salesforce, right? I mean, that's why I'm asking for somebody who's new and everybody is on that same level playing field that, you know, you get the cert to show that you, you know, cared enough to go learn it and that you get the concepts. But um, at the end of the day, if we're bringing people in that don't have that expertise, the, the differentiators are going to be all the other stuff that you bring the initiative, the communication skills, the ability to ask the right questions and convince me that you get what I'm talking about and you're somebody that I could give something to and you take it and run with it. And even if you've never done it before on the platform, you'll go figure out how to do it, right? Honestly, for a junior admin, that's what I care about. I don't care if you've you know, done a flow yet. I would think it was kind of weird if you had, frankly. Does that help? All right, so the book, I guess I got I got to answer the, the question, ready? So I'm kind of a, I'm a classic starter. I have a lot of projects I've started. So why getting this one over the finish line was very important to me personally, because I've, I've probably got like 20 half written books lying around somewhere over the years. 
another fun fact, actually, in 2009 or 10, when I left Salesforce, I partnered with um, somebody who um, he's, he's owned several consultancies. I won't say his name in case I don't know if it's a secret. I don't know why it would be. But uh, we were going to write a book um, for sales managers um, because one of the things I was very passionate back then, still am, I just haven't been working in the sales op space for a number of years. So it's kind of gone a little bit down on my, on my radar. But I believe that um, sales managers are vastly undertrained to really appreciate how to leverage Salesforce as a coaching tool, how to get their money's worth out of it. And especially frontline sales managers, maybe junior sales managers, a lot of times they've just stepped into the role. They've been a rep, so they know how to use Salesforce, but they don't really understand how do I mine the data to really help me figure out who needs coaching and where the process bottlenecks are and all the things that can really you know, make an impact on their team, not just for sales reporting. So um, we actually tried to um, get a book deal in 2010. They've missed out, man. Uh, we didn't try super hard. We were going to self-publish and there just weren't all the, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like it is today when it's quite as easy. And so we went, we went through um, some proposal processes and we just finally decided it wasn't time. And as I said, seasons for everything, right? I had to, went and did something else and forgot all about it, but that one's in a drawer somewhere. Um, and that, by the way, spun out of a, a course that I helped put together when I was at Salesforce, um, which was called, so you've got a dashboard now what, right? And that's the whole concept of like, great, I gave you a big shiny new dashboard. What are you going to do with it, right? Doesn't matter if I gave it to you, how are you actually going to use it to prove your team? Um, so that was a little fun fact, a little story that now you guys know somewhere out there is that book floating around. Um, I've got three that I'm, that are half started, but the one that might be most relevant to this group, um, I'm going to say this out loud because now it's going to put it out in the universe. You guys can collectively be my accountability partners. Um, it's rock your first Salesforce role. Um, so this, this book was not necessarily targeted to newcomers. I mean, I, I hope folks got value out of reading it. And I have certainly heard things that that tell me that they did, but there were some, you know, assumptions and terminology, and then also just some things that we didn't cover that are different. If it really is your first job and maybe you're in a different capacity than having the ability to implement processes and systems and even ask for trade-offs. I mean, you're not going to go on your first day work and be like, dude, I'll do this, but not that. Right. I mean, you gotta, you gotta earn the respect for some of that. You gotta earn the street cred. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, half done and um that's that's one that's next up there so show of hands would you buy it even though you've already read the other one all right so so you heard it here first i'll keep you posted but that that's hopefully next on the list awesome thank you for the breakdown brandon did that answer all of your questions yet yeah okay okay Vera. i know you had your hand up for a while so feel free to jump off mute so you can ask your question Hey, Jody. It's nice to finally meet you. I've been reading your posts for a while, so it's awesome to be able to talk to you. I have a question. This is more on like the like just curious side. So you've seen Salesforce from the start. You've been through a lot of the changes that Salesforce has gone through. So if you were magically put in control of like Salesforce's feature development, what's at the top of your wish list of features or like platform support that you would add? Ooh. <laughs> I have to pick one. Um, okay, it's it's funny because I you're always like we're always thinking about whatever our personal challenge of the day is, right? So I don't know that this would be my biggest one, but just today I was like, how is this still not here? How how is it that when I um, launch an approval process, I have to lock the record? I don't want to lock the record, and now I can't do all these other things that need to happen in tandem while this is being approved. So today, that would be my answer. I don't know in general that that would be the highest one on the list, um, but I would, I would say that for sure. Um, I think when I like kind of take a step back from, obviously that's what I would call a nitty gritty feature. Um, when, I, when I take a bit of a step back from a nitty gritty feature, what, what I would tell you is 
I wish they didn't go all in on flow. Um, I, I'm, I know I'm, I'm a bit of a naysayer in, in this regard, but, um, and what I mean by that is it's got a much higher learning curve than certainly than workflow back in the day. And, um, you know, process builder was a little bit more complex, but you could sit down and show somebody how to build a workflow in five minutes. Right. I mean, I've, I've had a career out of, you know, helping successfully transform executive assistants and team coordinators into very successful admins because you could, and they, they did amazing things that they learned quickly. And, um, flow is a little bit more intimidating and it's just hard. It's, I mean, you're not going to sit down in five minutes and do it. You might make your way through it, but you're probably going to break something in the process, right? Cause you're going to get your loop and you know, who knows what you're going to do. So for me, I I'm a huge power or, you know, proponent of the power of flow. You know, we got all sorts of crazy flows going on, by the way, I did not build them. I just QA them. Uh, lest, lest you think I'm bragging on my flow skills. I am not. Um, but what I, I think there's a challenge that some of that stuff that used to truly be quick and easy, I got to do an email alert, right? Even just an internal alert. I've got to do a very quick thing where, you know, I need this checkbox to check or whatever it is. I think we've overcorrected a little bit. Whereas, I mean, man, you can do a whole lot with clicks, but not code these days. But I think we've put a little bit of a barrier to entry to some of the stuff that really should be easy breezy. Um, which is going to, you know, I think it's part of the reason that Salesforce is starting to look and feel more like a traditional tech stack in terms of the resources we need to support it and the processes we need to release it and maintain it. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. That's evolution. And, you know, we've, we've gone from Salesforce being a very tactical um, process. Uh, yes. Um, and, you know, now it's a big enterprise strategic platform. And so we got to treat it differently, but there's a little bit of a trade-off. Am I the only one that finds flow intimidating? It can't just be me, right? No, definitely not. I was just sharing that in the chat. Um, I remember my first time trying to have a teammate. I got my first Salesforce admin job. Had been there for maybe six months. And he was like, oh, he was our senior. He's like, oh, I'll show you like, you know, some basics of like how you start doing a flow. And I remember him just like, I don't know, probably 10 different ways trying to explain it to me. And this was also before the nice fancy um, update on it. So yeah, I remember just looking at that thing and I could not understand it. I could not grasp the concept he was trying to share with me of like how you actually click into an element and update element and like what all that stuff meant inside of it was just like, what is this? I do not get what you're trying to do here. And I also didn't really come from uh, a very like technical background. I was a BA before that. So I had some like Excel skills and whatever, but I didn't really know anything like that programming, coding. And I know it's not that, but to some degree, it has some like hints of that, right? Of like sure, the how you layer on that. Exactly. So that was just, man, I was like really, really confused on how to do it. So no, I still feel the same way. And I agree wholeheartedly with everything you just said about the barrier to entry. And it is going to be interesting over the next, I don't know, a couple of years now that they really are making like everything flow um, because it is putting this pressure on these admins coming in to just like know how to do that because there's, there's no longer these other options, right? Like there technically is, but we're not really supposed to be using it. And there's also this like confusion around well, before it was one flow per object. And now is yeah. it, do we do multiple? Because we don't do workflows anymore. We don't do process yeah. builders. So it's going to be weird in the next couple of years as they figure this piece out for people to go back and look at environments, I think, and be like, oh, wow. Yeah, like this is kind of messy now because we didn't know what we were really doing in that time frame. So it'll be interesting. And um, I know my wife, she actually just started her Salesforce uh, career last year, uh, moved from a mortgage underwriter into that. And it's been kind of funny watching her do the same thing. Cause they'll sometimes ask her to like, take a stab at a flow. And it's like, man, yeah, I would not expect you to know how to do this. You know what I mean? Like you just started you're just trying to understand what Salesforce is. And now you're trying to get in here and do all this complex logic, which is kind of difficult. So, um, I definitely agree with all that. Those were really great questions. Thank you. Feel free to keep raising your hand or asking other ones that you might have. Um, 
I think another question, let's see, we talked a lot about- By the way, Vera, don't stop if you're loving it, right? Like, <laughs> this is not to say you shouldn't. It just, if it's not coming easy, it doesn't make sense that that would be the first thing to focus on, given all the other stuff. Yeah, 100%. It's not, uh, it's not the same advice. And I like what Jody said earlier too, even kind of quoting her own book where it's like, a lot of the times these are generalizations too. We're not trying to say specifically for every person, this is what you should do. Just generally speaking for the mass, right? Like this is not usually something somebody would dive into right off the bat. Um, one thing I did want to ask you, since we've been talking a lot about your book and advice around the admin role, um, I wanted to see if you could share some possible tips of what you felt has been the key ingredients to building a successful Salesforce team of admins. Sure, sure. Um, I mean, probably the, the most obvious is, you know, the things that I look in my book, the things that I said I hire for are, you know, what, what a lot of what we've talked about, right? Somebody who's proactive, somebody who's intellectually curious, um, somebody who's thinking about problems before somebody else knows that there's a problem, right? Those, those are really important skills. Um, I've been really lucky. I've hired great talent and a lot of teams have been with me in some way, shape or form. I always, I'm always going, wait, remind me again, who knows who here? Cause we've all worked together and, you know, like these three and when I'm over there with these three. So, um, so, you know, that is an, also another big piece of it is finding teams that people that effectively communicate, collaborate, no, no pride in ownership, right. Willing to help, um, um, you know, uh, one one thing that's you know I've also found is we trying to figure out what everybody's good at and what everybody loves and what everybody's not good at and what they don't love. I mean that's that's the thing I ask my team regularly. What do you want to do more of? What do you want to do less of? If you never had to do X again, what would that be? Because what's interesting is, you know, for everything that you hate, somebody else loves it. It's their favorite thing. I'm horrible at Excel, by the way. It's my dirty little secret. Um, horrible. Um, and so I hire teams that like rock the Excel and, um, you know, that, that's, that's the way it works. I, I, you know, you can wind me up and put me in front of any group and I can train people on the fly and I can sit with any level of business user from, you know, my most junior up to my CEO. I can do that. I've got, you know, people on my team that, you know, break out and sweat and they say, whatever you do, like, don't make me put in front of people. So, you know, it's really finding that mix. And part of the reason that I am so bullish on the Salesforce career is it's, there's something for everybody. Like it has a very broad spectrum. It's not, it is not a thing, even, even the admin role or the consultant role, it's not a thing. There are a million flavors of how you can Salesforce. And Salesforce in a big company or a small company, if you're in a small company, you're going to have a decidedly different kind of day than if you work in a big enterprise that's got a lot of rigor and rules. And some people love rigor and rules. Some people say, I want to like jump in and do it all. Some people want to have that front, I call it front of the house, right? Where I interact with users and I'm also training and I'm also kind of wearing the BA hat. And some people are like, I almost would like to sit in a room and code all day, except I know I'm not actually coding, right? Like there's every flavor in between. And that's why I love the, the ecosystem. That's why I'm so bullish. Why I say to everybody, there is a role for you and you and you and you. They're all going to look different. It might take a little harder to find it. You got to find your flavor, find your niche, but they're out there. And then even on a single team inside an organization, the skills look different, feel different. There's different personality types. And to me, finding what lights everybody up generally also is what they're good at, right? Um, and it's also one of the things, by the way, that I talk to people about in the interview process is I always ask, like, tell me about what you love and what you don't love. And it's not a, it's not a gotcha question. Truth of the matter is, guess what? If you tell me you love X, Y, Z and you hate this and my job is a bunch of this and I don't have any X, Y, Z, like it's not that you weren't a good, you know, candidate. It's you, you had to come here and been miserable. And so there's an element of that, that I asked everybody to really remember and consider and also, you know, to be honest, because the last thing we want to do is get the job just to get the job and be like, oh, my God, I'm doing all the parts of it that I actually don't want to do. I actually want to kind of be part of a business team and business operations. And I landed smack in the middle of technology or vice versa. Right. Because those are the different flavors of admin jobs. So those are things to be thinking about 
um, as, as you're out there. And, and, and even in the beginning, when you're in your first couple of roles, like I would say, pay attention, pay attention to what parts you like. Doesn't mean, again, we got to, we got to earn the right to give that back. Right. It doesn't mean week two, you're like, I'm sorry, dude, this is not lighting me up. Right. <laughs> Usually does not go over well. So not advice for the first year won't be in my book, but it is part of kind of the beauty of, again, getting the street cred, earning that reputation, whether it be in a company or when you start getting recruited out, I don't do jobs I don't want to do anymore. I don't have to. And I say that not to brag, but to say like, that's part of, you know, the benefit of establishing yourself as a reputation. That's why it's worth going above and beyond again, doing it with those business boundaries, but it's so that you can figure out what those parts are and, and shape a job and shape a career that fit you. And again, I love this career because it, regardless of the you, there's a way to do it. So, you know, it's going to, it's going to be what you need and not be so shabby from a paycheck perspective, might I add. <laughs> That's great advice. We had someone uh, last week, Kalen Moss speak to us and he's really kind of turned his career into more of like marketing cloud. And he shared very similar insight. Um, and being now uh, in the consulting world, now that I'm doing that, I've also noticed the same, like I work with um, a company here and there when they have stuff that they can't take on and their niche, it feels small. I'm sure it's not. I'm sure there's tons of people that do this, but it's literally just starting people up that just purchase Salesforce. They're spinning up their work, but it's specifically for like Pardot. And it's like, that's what they do. That's only what they do. And if it's outside of that scope, they're passing on it, which I guess when you first start your role, I feel like that's almost counterintuitive because you kind of want to go in be this jack of all trades. Oh, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. Um, but I think your advice is really key of, it's not really about that. It's really trying to figure out, okay, yeah, maybe do that to begin with, experiment with it, see what you like and don't. But then from there, really double down on the things you do like that coupled with your strengths. Um, like you said, some people might really enjoy speaking with stakeholders and other people hate that, you know? So it's like really trying to figure out that balance on the team of like, okay, in those situations as a team leader or somebody else on the team, who do we actually want to kind of take that type of um, ticket or that take that type of role? Um, so I love that. That was really, really good advice. Um, let me see if there's anything that came in here. I can't remember. I yeah, I'm to... bad at reading questions. <laughs> no, you're good. Shout I'm out like... if there's something there I need to respond to. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Uh, Megan, go ahead. So I had a question that I don't actually have a problem with, but I'm in a fellowship and I see a lot of people within the fellowship having this issue and I try to give them advice. Um, but I just wonder what your advice would be. So you talk a lot about having the ownership mentality, but also about setting boundaries mm -hmm. and I think because I've been in leadership positions before, so I was a professor for a lot of years. And in that role, you know, like I'm the one giving grades, I'm the one with the information. So I don't have a problem, you know, sort of setting boundaries. Um, but <laughs> in the, you know, with that ownership mentality, you wanna go above and beyond. But when setting boundaries, you know, you also want to let the people that you're working for know, you know, like, I'm not going to be here 24 hours a day. And a lot of people who are in the fellowship with me are having a hard time adjusting to that and doing both of those things. Or I'm like, you know, just let them know you'll get to it tomorrow. You know, don't <laughs> like my time's done. My laptop is closed. Everybody knows, you know, like my team's thing is off, I'm done, right? But there are people who are still working, you know, even when the hours are over. So I just wondered what your suggestion would be for me to, you know, help them out. Yeah, yeah, so there's a lot there actually, right? So um, I, think, I think some of that is understanding it, when you go take a role, what's the culture, what's the expectation, right? And to a certain extent, you can ask that and they'll tell you to a certain extent that you 
um, might even just say, hey, would it be okay if I, you know, I'm so excited to work here. Could I, could I, you know, potentially get on the phone with, with a coworker and just have a get to know you chat, something like that. Like you can ferret some, some of that stuff out. Um, some companies will be very straightforward. Like, you know, we, we, we do, we're especially consulting. I don't know if you're fellowship in a consulting firm, but, you know, consulting firms have client engagements and slightly different hours. And it's a different type of thing than in-house in-house people also have different expectations, but they, Consulting firms will usually be a little bit more upfront with what the expectation is, whether it be travel, whatever. I should also add, um, you know, we also do deployments on weekends and evenings. Like that's another thing to know if you're going into this business that you will work weekends and evenings at times. Doesn't mean you should do it every day. It doesn't mean we want to do it regularly, but we deploy stuff that can't get deployed during the day. And so, you know, if you know you had a big weekend deployment coming up, then absolutely take take the day off the week before and get yourself ready for it. But I, I share that again in the spirit of like, I am all about setting expectations. So there's a little bit of that is just making sure that expectations are aligned right from the get go. Um, I, I like to say, you've heard me say a couple of times, like, I don't actually believe when I talk about setting boundaries, that the answer to that is my first week of work. I'm like, sorry, dude, I'm not doing this. Like, like there's a certain extent, right. Where, you, to a certain extent, you, you've agreed to be there. You thought that was going to be the right thing. I'm going to be really honest. Part of it is you got to suck it up for a while, right? There is something to that. I know it's counterintuitive to my whole second half of my book, but that is part of it. You, you go, you prove yourself, you work the extra mile. Obviously, if we're talking about something that is a toxic situation, I mean, I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying we're, there's, there's sometimes we're in the middle of a project, man. It's crunch time. Like, it's like it is crunch time. We are going to work a lot. You got to make sure we've got figured out in advance with the team, so we know if we've got childcare and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, exactly. But what I will also say, why I think these things are not necessarily incongruent, is part of setting boundaries and part of what I try to do in the book is how to do it so that they don't even realize you're doing it, right? That that's that's the trick. The trick isn't that you're like, talk to the hand, I'm busy or, you know, the, the trick is to say, absolutely, I'd love to. Let's see what else is on my plate. Can you help me prioritize which one um, can wait, right? So I'm, I'm, they didn't hear me say no, they heard me say yes and nod and smile. When somebody comes to me and asks something that I can't do, I'm, you know, I'm not saying I'm too busy. I'm saying, well, let's talk about what you need. And I don't think I can get to that right now, but here's a few things I can do, right? So, so that is what I would offer up in that situation is there's some nuances to how do you do this in a way where they, they feel like they got value, right? They feel heard. They feel like they got value from the conversation. They know what the next step is. And yet you manage to, you know, avoid overwhelm. And some of that is, again, um, just little tips and tricks, right? Like, we're very accustomed to somebody saying, can you have that done by morning? So somebody's there burning the midnight oil because they thought somebody told them they had to have it done by morning. Actually, it was a question. Can we have this done by morning? The answer is, oh my God, I'd love to, but there is no way it's going to happen. Okay, great. When do you think we can have it? Like that's, that's a small difference that if we incorporate a few of those things, you'd be amazed what can happen. So that that might be my advice to them is to, you know, make sure that they have equal expectations, make sure that they're thinking through why are they there so late? And are there some tips and tricks in part two that might help? <laughs> Thank you. That I think I think that does help because I remember reading through it. I'm like, this is diplomacy, the 101. This is just yeah. And so, Which so goes I think to it does show help. you about transferable yeah. transferable skills, right? Yeah. Like you got that. You know that. You've been doing that in your entire career. So right. just because you're feeling like I don't know not about Salesforce, don't put that to the side. Like show right. up and talk about diplomacy and be diplomatic right. and and show how you've you know made a career out of that already. Right. And I am lucky because my fellowship is with a financial institution. So when my hours are up, I do just get to close it. And <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm done. Everyone else is too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't rub it in, Megan. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know. But <laughs> yeah, I think those points are really great. Um, 
Would you say, uh, again, kind of going back to the generalization, I think uh, for the majority of it, like you said, perfect. How would you say you would maybe tweak that for someone that's either like a solo consultant or maybe like a first hire um, on the team? I know there's a few, and that's why I want to ask it, because I know there's a few that are looking at jobs right now where they're either going to be like the first or second coming in, and they kind of are feeling more of that weight to be like, man, what do I say? Because they're kind of looking to me for those answers. Would you tweak that at all from what you said? Yeah, I think in that instance, it's um, more often than not, there's a misunderstanding of what's involved, right? Sometimes we make it seem too easy. Um, and by the way, very often we're to blame with um, over-promising deadlines that we can't meet. I, I do talk about in the book about the estimate equation. This is something I'm very guilty of in my life because you know, sure, I can, we, oh, totally, we can build that. I mean, I gotta talk, have that done tomorrow. Well, yeah, if the phone doesn't ring and if nobody's blowing up your phone because there's something else to do. Oh, and if we didn't hit that weird Salesforce gotcha that always happens when you forget about the blah, 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 and now have to go reverse the blah, 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 like all of that stuff. And I, you know, I, for one, am horrible about it. So I think that's an important thing is for us to hold ourselves you know, to realistic deadlines, but also for people to understand all the pieces and parts, right? What What's interesting to me is more often than not, I find when we're doing something, we can get it to 75% or 80% really quickly. You know, we can mock something up, we can get the report built, we can do whatever. And it's the devil's in the details in loading the data or talking about how we're going to train it or actually talking about the deployments, whatever all the other stuff is. And we forget to talk about that. And our business partners also forget to hear that or don't hear that or choose to not hear that, right? Or just don't know about it. And so they're like, Jody, I sat in a meeting with you a week ago. This thing was almost done. What have you been doing? Well, yeah, they didn't know that, again, other things, but also that there's a lot of things that happen, you know, behind the scenes. Um, I think, I think also um, it's not uncommon, whether it be for a technical challenge, whether it be for a data challenge, whether it be for just business process challenge to make sure we're communicating that up, right? Um, a lot of times we think we're personal superheroes. And even though somebody handed me the data file that I thought was gonna be pretty clean and now I look at it and realize the entire thing needs to be scrubbed and formatted and deduped. Sometimes we think that that means I have to stay up late and do it. Right. And that's where I think some of the overwhelm comes in. So it's, you know, always erring on the side of, you know, it's not your responsibility to be a superhero and not sleep for a week. It is your responsibility to raise your hand as quick as you can and explain in detail in context what the issue is. It's not like this data sucks, right? It's like, let me give you some really specific examples of some of the challenges we're having. You might not be aware of that in order to you know, load something like this, we actually need to do this and this and this. And what I'm finding when I look through this is da da da. So, and also with a solution in hand, right? That's another just good business tip. You guys all know this from your experience that um, I'm also going to go there and say, so here's what I'm going to propose. It might be the trade off, it might be I need more resources, it might mean how about if, whatever those things are. But I, th I do think those are kind of learned behaviors. Um, and actually for somebody in a, in a solo spot, I'd say like, learn them sooner rather than later. Right. Cause you don't even have friends to keep you honest friends in, in, in the job. I'm sure you have lots of friends. To keep you honest. <laughs> uh, that was really good. I appreciate you answering that. Um, and one thing I, we were actually just talking about this a little bit earlier, Vera and myself, um, where you get into that bias where everybody kind of assumes that you have that same common knowledge. So what you touched on, right? It's okay. I learned how to do this thing. And now in my head, the, the instructions to do that thing are simple, but I'm also calculating, well, yeah, this could go wrong. This could go wrong. But in my head, if it goes right, this is a pretty simple, straightforward thing. And you almost oversimplify it when you get into that habit by this other person that has no idea what you're talking about. They could think this is like a 10 as far as the difficulty, and maybe it's not, but that's what they're thinking. They have no idea. And we get into that habit of like, oh, well, yeah, this may, I could probably have this done tomorrow. And you start to word vomit a little bit on your like deadlines and things like that. And you don't need to. Um, the reality is they have no idea what it is that you need to do. 
And um, I think that's that's been super helpful to try to break that habit. One follow-up question to that was, you talked about trying to raise your hand and communicate that as fast as possible. Is there any other tools that you've used um, or seen used to help communicate like the complexity so that your stakeholders can start catching on to being like, oh, actually, this is a little more difficult than I expected. Yeah. So um, it's, it's, I wouldn't call it a tool and I wouldn't call it particularly sophisticated, but um, I do train my stakeholders. I mean, every day is I have a I have funny Jody speak, as everybody says, which is I tell them what's easy breezy. I tell them what is complex config. And I tell them like bigger than a bread box and really tangly. Those are my words. And so if you work with me long enough, you know what those things mean. But, you know, and again, I'm being a little tongue in cheek here, but I, I do literally with people that I work with regularly, they know when I say easy breezy, it means no problem. We got it. This is a ticket. We'll turn it around in a day. They, they, we, we talk about it. We put, you know, orders of magnitude around it. And, and one of the reasons I think this is so important, Jordan, is where there's value to be added is not just us remembering to tell them what's hard. It's also to surprise them with what's easy, right? That's, that's where we can add value because a lot of times they're not going to ask for things because in their head, it, I figured that was really hard. It's actually what they need and what they want. But like, I had no idea, like you can give me a knowledge base in like a day with like a thing that's out of the box, like things like that. They don't know, or, you know, a path. I mean, this think about all the things that we can flip on with literally a button or you activate a feature and like, whoa, it's there. Like they don't know that. And so part of our job is articulating, you know, the context of what's difficult, but again, calling questions out that things that maybe they didn't ask for to say something like, um, Hey, would it add value? Would it be useful if I could, you know, X, Y, Z, whatever that is. And, you know, that's where you start getting the points on the board. So, you know, use, and, and, and again, I would say, you know, they might say, well, yeah, but we don't really need it. And I'd say, what if it's a quick hit, easy breezy? Oh yeah, we want it. Right. So this is where requirements are. I always use the word people laugh at me. I don't know why they're fungible. Like there's no such thing as requirements. They change with context. I used an example recently. I just moved. I bought a house. I swore I would never have a swimming pool again. I had one 15 years ago. It was a mess of my life. I swore that I swore that I needed, you know, one story and and and. Well, guess what? I live in a friggin' two-story house. There's a stupid swimming pool, like all this stuff because the context changed. And when they served it up to me and said, Well, what if you can't have this because there's a trade-off involved? But what if you like sure, all of a sudden things changed and I made different decisions and the things that I said were must-haves really weren't. And that's really holds true more often than not for things that our business users are telling us are their requirements as well. Yeah. I don't know how many projects I've taken under the, that assumption before I got a little bit better at that and being like, well, dang, this sounds like I should have to do this. I stay up all night doing it or a weekend, like you said, I turn it in or I get it done. And I think that it was like a code red and it's like, oh, okay. And then they get back to it in like a month. And you're like, dude, I just spent all this time. Like I thought it was a code red and it really wasn't. It wasn't actually as big of a deal as the person made it. Um, so it is trying to like stay in check with that. That's really good advice on how to try to figure out the balance there. Um, I want to respect our time. I know you uh, had 60 minutes with us. Is there anything that you felt uh, you wanted to get to that we didn't talk about? Anything about your book? Anything about other places we can go and support you? Um, I have great proponents already. Many of you have been um, very vocal. So thank you very much. It really means a lot. And um, I've, I've been blown away by um, just the support of the community for this book. Um, if you haven't, um, it wouldn't hurt my feelings if you wanted to leave a review on LinkedIn. Um, they, they are like gold in getting the algorithm to actually start marketing on your behalf. Um, I, I think I told you earlier, I'm a horrible marketer because I do have this day job, um, but I do have a landing page at SF Admin Book. I have to look at it. That's how, how infrequently I talk about it. Um, I'm cheating. Um, sfadminbook.com. You can also download um, 10 discovery questions. It's a cheat sheet, um, but it'll put you on my mailing list and there may be some exciting things coming in Q2. Be the first to know. 
Um, and I'm pretty sure I'm already linked in with all of you or most of you. Um, but you know, you can, you know, keep keep me posted. I am um, I have great faith. I've seen what things you guys say and do online. This is a very extremely talented group. I always say the future of the Ohana is bright. That's not just words. I mean it. You guys are busting it. I um, I do. I, I, I don't want to give away anybody's um, work, but I will say I have somebody at work that I periodically say, dude, I literally have an entire community of LinkedIn people that are like working their tail off. Like, go be like them just with what you're doing with the initiative and how you know, guys are studying and grouping up to learn new things. Because by the way, that doesn't end, right? I mean, it doesn't end. I, you know, I was laughing. My flow skills are horrible. My Excel skills are horrible. Don't, that's another one that like, don't be, don't do what I do. Like go learn Excel for sure. Um, but I guess one of the last things I would leave you with this is, is this, like, there will be days where you are going to feel like you don't know enough, probably most days, especially when you're getting started. And what I'm here to tell you is I feel like that every day as well. And I've been doing this for two decades. And it, by the way, it's not just a feeling. There's literally like I could take eight years and have more Salesforce things to study. It's the nature of the beast. It's big, it's broad, it's changing. You will never know it all. You, are, you will never even know most of it. So get comfortable with that. Know that that is true for everybody that you are talking to, everybody that you are interviewing with. And you know the trick is just figuring out the art of the possible, how to get the answers, and really how to be as focused on what do they really need as you are with the solution. You can find the solution. The harder part is figuring out what do they need, why, when do they need it, how, you know, how, how, how will they know it's the right solution, how is it going to add value. So I would, I would leave you with that thought. You're in good company. Amazing. Thank you so much again for your time tonight, Jody. And just a reminder, everybody, like we mentioned in the beginning, I know some trickled in after, we'll have this posted in our community forever and also on YouTube forever. So we'll get that all post-produced and uh, sent over. And uh, if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out to Jody. She's always happy to help, like she said. And then I plugged all her stuff and we'll do that in the community as well so that you can go over to the websites and book sites that she has as well. Yes, Other than I look that- forward to celebrating with your posts. Here, I got my <laughs> job, I got my cert, whatever it is. I okay, awesome. We can celebrate yeah. that too. Look at this. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you so much again, Jody. And uh, we'll talk soon. See you, everybody. Thank you for having me, everybody. Very Thanks, great Jody. to see you all. Thanks, Jody. Thank you. Bye.